This is Episode 9 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. In all the time you've spent thinking uh, about presidents and been around presidents and political figures, have you ever kept a diary? Never did. Why not? And I should regret it if it was worth regretting. I don't know. Probably lazy. Um... You've never gone back and written things down after you had a conversation with somebody like that? Oh, uh, but I could probably count on the one hand. Um, partly, you, you talk about memory. I, I mean, for most of my life at least, I've, had a, I've been able to remember. Um, and it's, 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 again, it's odd. It's, uh, it's like things that you need to remember you can almost will yourself to remember. Now, it's also true, it's interesting, now, uh, in my 60s, I look at the transcripts, for example, of the Ford book, um, and those 160 or so interviews that I did, and now, of course, I'm drawing upon them as part of my research, and I, <laughs> I'm struck, not so much by what I misremembered, but what I failed to remember, there are you know, oh, there's this wonderful story here, oh, and I and I would have missed it if I hadn't gone back and 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 checked the transcript. So, but no, I a diary, you know, in in retrospect, yeah, you, know, you know, I find a oh, someday uh, 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 here. I mean, I should feel guilty. You know, the Queen has kept a diary. Queen Elizabeth has kept a diary all her life and works on it every day. And can you imagine someday some authorized biographer, you know, is going to be admitted to the royal archives and they're going to throw open the first of these hundreds of volumes and you know, I'd like I'd like to be I'd like to be there. Which American president have you spent the most time with, either in office or after? Well, Gerald Ford. I mean, if you mean physically living president. conversation back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I got to know President Ford Who else? well. Ronald Reagan, of course. I mean, I, and I don't want to exaggerate our intimacy, um, but I was uh, there. I chose there when the Alzheimer's letter was written. I got a call alerted me to the fact that it was going to come. I, 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 rem- I, I will never forget the last conversation I had with President Reagan. Um, you know, he used to um, come up to the library. Uh, the, the Alzheimer's letter was in, I want to say, October of 94. It was the fall of 94. And uh, I was there for another year and a half. And he would come up. And uh, I take him through temporary exhibits um, and, and the like and uh, or he'd sign books or you know but I mean he was still he was still actively involved and, and Im- immensely proud I mean very modest because I'd sat in meetings with the, when they were first designing the exhibits and he was I- incredibly humble I mean he you know couldn't believe there was going to be this Institution with his name on it, and that I'm convinced that was genuine. But at the same time, he was he was very once it was done, he was very proud of it. it was, that was part of his legacy, that, to, to both he and Mrs. Reagan, that that meant the world. But anyway, the thing I will never forget, it be early '96, just before I left, and he came up, and we went through a temporary exhibit, and it was lunchtime, so we were going to have lunch. And we are going to um, a place over 10, 12 miles from Simi Valley where the library was located. And so they said, well, you know, get in the back seat with the president, and, which, was, which was nice. I appreciate that um, because they realized it was my last chance to be with him. And, you know, I don't know. I can't explain it or justify it, but I guess when you're younger, uh, you're willing to take chances or say things that you would be too cautious to say later. But I remember we were sitting back there, and I thought, this is the last chance I have to talk to Ronald Reagan. 
and, and it just popped out. I said, you know, Mr. President, I'd be really, really interested to know what did it feel like to be shot? And of course, I was referring to the March 1981 assassination attempt. And, you know, he didn't bat an eyelash. He, he started talking, and I realized he was talking about being shot in the movies. His experience in the Westerns, where he was, quote, shot. And of course, famously, you know, his he, loss of hearing in one ear came about as a result of a of a gun going off, apparently too close. But anyway, and it was just it was just you know a, a remarkable experience, you know. And I realized then what the progression of the disease. You know, he was famously a great storyteller. Well, he 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 didn't ever tell a lot. At least he. He would if you asked, but he, he didn't volunteer a lot of stories about the White House. He talked a lot about Hollywood, and he most the subject he most liked talking about was his boyhood in Dixon, and above all, his experience as a lifeguard. The thing he was proudest of was he saved 77 lives as a lifeguard. And he had very interesting, to me at least, it was a real window on his intelligence and character, he, um, he instinctively understood that, that there were differences between men and women and how they reacted to being saved. Men, of course, pretended that they was unnecessary. You know, women, on the other hand, were much more um, truthful, much more honest, and sometimes much more clinging, you know, <laughs> to their savior. But anyway, it, it told me, first of all, even at that point in his life, you know, he, he'd been an observer. You know, the first thing he wanted to be uh, as a boy was a cartoonist. And you think, what is a cartoonist? A cartoonist is someone who steps back and not only observes or reproduces, but thinks there's a message in the cartoon. And I, I, I sensed, I mean, no great revelation, but I sensed that Reagan was much much more intelligent, much more observant, and much more remote um, from which to observe. So anyway, it was um, um, the sort of thing you, you, don't, you don't forget. I was uh, invited to uh, go out to Simi Valley to uh, do commentary at the time of the internment, and uh, for a network that show her name nameless, but you might be able to uh, judge for yourself. Uh, an anchor person assured me before we went on the air, thinking that you know, I was Professor Smith, uh, and you don't have to worry about being too objective here. <laughs> well, you know, and in some ways. Isn't that a problem with the media, whether it's left or right? I mean, the fact that it is left and right tell you that objectivity, the whole fake news, fakery, um, the downgrading of truth, which uh, the profound dishonesty that that represents and the danger that that represents to democracy. You know, when Jefferson talked about of people who thought it could be ignorant and free, you know, could be neither. And it's a form of ignorance to deny that there's such a thing as discernible, measurable, honest truth. And and the fact that it may have been abused by some journalists, media types, readily acknowledged, but the response, but the, you know, the answer is not to dismiss out of hand um, or bury all journalism. Anyway, that leads to my theory, my Einsteinian revelation. <laughs> the older you get, the more alienated you become from the evolving culture around you. And this is a force of nature. This is an evolutionary good because it means 
you are increasingly reconciled to your own mortality. Um, in short, you tell yourself, you project at the rate of generalized cultural decay that we are experiencing. Imagine 10 or 20 years from now. Do you really want to be a part of that? Do you really want to feel that much more alienated? So it, it becomes, um, it's a, of course a great rationalization, but it becomes a justification for death. <laughs> How's that for profundity? <laughs> it, it would appear to me <clears throat> that you spend a lot of time in your life alone. Yes. Not married. Right. Well, it's no, it's no secret I happen to be gay. And, and the reason I, I don't flaunt it, I, 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 it's, it's not insignificant, in my opinion, um, because of the writing I do, and biography in particular. And this may sound like the ultimate rationalization, but I, 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 with time, I've come to perceive a relationship um, in some ways a benefit. First of all, I'm very lucky. I would be the worst parent in the world. I, I have friends who are, I mean, I cannot imagine, I, I can't imagine anything more demanding, more legitimately demanding than, than raising a child. I can't imagine anything uh, requiring more of your time and effort and, and resources, and, and legitimately so. You have that obligation. The world is full of people who are biologically capable of parenting who are dreadful parents. Um, and I, uh, frankly, <laughs> consider myself fortunate. I actually, I, I'm not one of those people who wishes I had children. Um, I, I would be a terrible parent. First of all, I would be, a, oh God, I would be a perfectionist um, to the nth degree and therefore perpetually dissatisfied and a perpetual nag. I mean, I just, there's so many reasons why, and the other thing to be perfectly honest with you is if you're going to be a parent, it's got to be the most important thing in your life. It's got to be the central function of your existence for at least 20 or 30 years. And that's an unselfishness that I don't possess. Go, go back to some things you were saying earlier. When you had your heart attack, a lot of people have been inviting you over for Thanksgiving dinner, yes. and you said you didn't want to go. Right. And then tie that to the fact that you spend an awful lot of time alone. What I'm getting at is, are you happier alone? Absolutely. I mean, I you know, it, it, I understand because it is outside the experience of most people. I mean, I don't purport to be conventional in many respects. Um, there, it, it's just assumed. You know, let's face it. We live in a culture where, overwhelmingly, people pair up. They may be successful, uh, or not. But even if they're unsuccessful, there, there's still an overwhelming urge and expectation that they'll try it again. Um, I never felt that urge, um, and I was never particularly interested in. Uh, reproducing myself or extending my life through others. Um, I suppose I'm vain enough to hope that some of my books will outlive me. I think I've written three books that will uh, outlive me, although even there I have, you know, no illusions. But but the point, um, the, the assumption, the universal assumption that to be alone is to be lonely uh, is, is simply not true. Um, I want to go back, and, though, because I, I raised it and I, I want to complete the thought. See, I think lots of people, gay people perhaps, obviously, but again, I, you know, when I talk about 50 years ago, it was a very different culture. But I certainly had a profound sense 
of being different. And, and lots of people, in various ways, it may be their, you know, the color of their skin, it may be the accent in which they speak, it may be their economic position, it may be their education levels. I mean, there are, you know, all sorts of factors that contribute to a sense of differentness. So once you have that, you can, you have to deal with it. And the, and the curious thing is, in my case, I think there's a direct connection between that and what I do as a biographer. And I mean by that is, I learned, and I can't tell you how early, I can't remember when I did it, to develop, that's the only way I can put it, an essentially protective mechanism, a kind of sixth sense. Um, of si- You can walk into a room and size it up instantly. What it is you need to say or not say, or do, or not do, to make certain that your secret remains secret. Now, that requires, in turn, real observation, powers of observation. It requires a kind of detachment, a standing back. And, 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 and you really do, or can, I think, develop an extra sensitivity about people and their motives. And you look beneath the surface. Um, and it, again, initially, it's a protective thing uh, in your own interests. But it's easy to see how it can be applied intellectually. Or politicians. This town is full of people in the political world. Now I think we've moved beyond it. But I mean, certainly there was a time when there were any number of closeted gays in politics, working on the Hill, maybe in office, maybe not. For them, the boss, you know, the campaign, the cause, was something that they could give themselves to with total commitment, you know, passionate immersion. Um, It was a relationship or a substitute for a relationship. Um... And, and, you know, what's interesting is, and she has speculation, as society evolves, I remember reading once, I thought, a brilliant column. I think it was in the Post. Someone wrote, and I thought, boy, this is prescient. As we get to the point where, for example, now same-sex marriage is the norm. As we get to the point where gay people are no longer intrinsically thought of as them, Um, the next generation, the generation after that, for whom it's just not an issue if we get to that point, what what does that do? My generation, and I think me particularly, felt an obligation to excel, to work harder, to do better. You know, it was almost an element of self-justification. And I think, um, and I and I have friends who certainly contemporaries who who fit that same model, if you will. And I and I'm sure that has something to do with the 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 output. I mean, the the, the book after book after book, the 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 kind of all in. I mean, I would hope to think that you know the work ethic alone. But I but I think there was there was an extra, and and it would be interesting once that is removed. Once that incentive slash perceived necessity disappears, it, it'll be very interesting to see what future, how future generations deal internally um, with the issue. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.